hello folks uh let, let me be give up more one more minute uh to get started all right uh let's get started uh good morning good evening to folks wherever we are joining from welcome to the uh next webinar from multi core wear which is uh, key studies uh, from the center of excellence group which focuses on ai ml this is presented by a team of experts from multi core wear the presenters will continue narrative uninterrupted until the end of their presentations in the meantime we are keeping the q and a window open please keep sending us your questions through the q and a window i will collate the questions which the solution architects will answer at the end of their presentations to maintain the order the webinar will be listening mode only for the audiences this is a recorded event so we will make the video available for the registered audience after the event uh, just a quick snapshot before we get into the core of the webinar which is two important case studies presented by our subject matter experts from the coe group multi core wear as an organization was founded in 2009 headquartered in the silicon valley with delivery centers across the world we have delivery centers in the us the eu uh, china as well as the biggest uh, center being from chennai india we have about 350 plus employees across the globe uh, at various roles and 170 plus of them are focused in ml and ai which is the center of excellence group that is delivering this webinar we do software ip and services among other things a uh, quick snapshot of what our core expertise are compilers and tool chains the different sensors video codecs and a wide life cycle of low level mid level and high level Uh, work around optimization porting algorithm creation problem solving around the ml and ai space broadly the company as such is uh, you know targeted for two markets one is the media and ai analytics and the second one is focusing on autonomous vehicle and automotive technologies this coe group uh, is under the media and ai analytics business unit of the maya bu a uh, quick snapshot a uh, core expertise that is across the company compilers and optimization tools algorithms and libraries and in the gamut of uh, artificial intelligence machine learning deep learning computer vision video solutions uh, this is a very small snapshot of the core expertise but then what is important is we've been in the business for a little over 12 years and if you look at the the customers and partners that we've been working with we are there are some marquee customers that are there i won't mention the names this is a very small subset we work with a lot of big companies start small and especially the coe group has built uh, you know multi year relationship with a lot of these global customers and partners uh, my name is shiva i head uh, Maya be used marketing and product management, and I'll hand it over to the other speakers, and they will introduce themselves. Hope you 
find this webinar and the two case studies that we are talking useful. Again, if you have questions, the Q&A window is open. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. From whichever part of the world uh, you are dialed in. First, let me thank you all for you know, taking your time and uh, joining this webinar. Welcome to my uh, presentation. Today, we will uh, discuss about enabling Android NN support in DSP and other hardware accelerators. Android NN is abbreviation for Android Neural Networks API, which is used for running AI workloads from your Android app. If you're an app developer, you will use frameworks like TFLight Runtime or PyTorch from your uh, Android app. Those frameworks will use this NN API behind the scenes to run uh, your compute intensive AI workloads by taking full advantage of all the hardware available in your SOC. So with that said, let's dive right in to explore about the NN API part. Target audience for this webinar can be broadly classified into following list. One, if you are building Android based hardware platform and you want to add an AI accelerator to your hardware, it can be a custom ASIC or a DSP or a GPU. Number two, if you are building a custom AI accelerator and you want to enable Android support to tap into the mobile AI market. Number three, if you have a legacy solution to run AI workloads in Android, meaning you are running your AI workloads in Android without using NN API and you want to take the NN API route. If you fall within any of this category, we have expertise to help you. Agenda for this session is as follows. First, we will talk about Android OS and its usage. Second, we will talk about AI and Android and uh, advantages of using your mobile platform for ML inference. Third, we will talk about Android NN API and its functions. Then we will move on to NN Hall Driver, which is a key component to run your ML models on Android device. Next, we will talk about how to implement a new Hall Driver for your hardware. Last, we will talk about recent developments on NN API from Android 13 and uh, beyond. Let's see a quick overview about Android and its ecosystem. As you can see in the graph, Android is leading the mobile OS market by a huge margin. It has almost 75% market share. Its nearest competitor, iOS, holds the remaining 25% market. Android's dominance is expected to continue as we don't have another open source player in the market. Coming to Android's ecosystem, earlier Android was only regarded as smartphone operating system. This is changing right now. As you can see, we have Android TVs, AR VR devices, uh, portable gaming consoles, and home automation systems. All these are powered by Android. Home appliances are also increasingly becoming smart with a display attached to it. One such example that I quoted here is a smart refrigerator. We even have coffee machines running on Android right now. This constantly evolving ecosystem is mainly due to the open and the customizable nature of Android, which allows device manufacturers to customize it for their hardware and use cases. Next, we will talk about AA on Android. Here we will uh, explore the AI capabilities of uh, current generation mobile devices, which are powered by Android. Let's talk about some of the leading Android SOC and its AI capabilities. As you can see here, all these SOCs are heterogeneous in nature with a dedicated AI processor attached to it. For example, in Qualcomm, we have Hexagon DSP and in MediaTek, we have uh, APU, which is AI processing unit, and in Google, we have Tensor Processing Unit, and in Exynos, we have a dual core NPU, which is Neural Processing Unit, and as well as a DSP. So, all these dedicated AI cores have unlocked a huge potential for running your AI models on mobile or portable devices. 
Next, we will talk about running ML inference on mobile device and factors contributing to its growth. First, a powerful mobile SOC. We talked about this in our previous slide. Dedicated AA chips in mobile SOC, which is also energy efficient, is a major reason. Second, efficient ML models, meaning lightweight ML models with accuracy comparable to larger model which runs on cloud. These two factors, increase in processing power as well as lightweight ML models are a big deal to enable on-device processing. Next, coming to advantages, running in device has no recurring cost. You use processing power of the device rather than paying for cloud compute cycles. Next is low latency. Since data is processed in device and there is no need to transmit data back and forth from the cloud, latency is very, very less and uh, it is very suitable for real-time processing. Last one is privacy. With increased focus on privacy in all levels by corporates, governments and individuals, on-device inference is the best option because your sensitive data stays in your device and it is only processed within your device. Coming to some of the common on-device inference that we use in our day-to-day -day life, if you use OK Google or Google Photos or uh, video calls in uh, Gmeet or uh, Zoom, many of these tools have now moved to on-device inference uh, because of the factors that we talked about earlier. So this pretty much sums up AI on Android. Till now, we have discussed about Android OS, dedicated AI processor in mobile SOCs, and benefits of running ML model in device. Now it's time to move on to NNAPI. NNAPI allows app developers to take advantage of the dedicated AI processes that are present in the current uh, mobiles. So let's dive right in. First, let's take a look at Android architecture. This will give us a better picture of how NNAP fits inside the Android platform. At the top, we have system apps, which is a Android app that end users consume. Second, we have Java API framework, where the entire future set of Android is exposed to user through this layer. Third, we have native C, C++ libraries, which has native code required for many core system components. Some of these libraries are also made available to app developers through the Java API. Next, we have Android runtime. As the name suggests, this is the runtime used by Android for compiling and executing apps and services. Fifth, we have the hardware abstraction layer, which is abbreviated as HAL. This is of interest to us because this is where Android will communicate with all the hardware and sensors attached to the device. For example, we have camera and Bluetooth components which will communicate with the respective Bluetooth and camera sensor and it will send the data to the Android. Similarly, NNAP will sit within this hardware abstraction layer and it will help us to run ML workloads coming from the Android app in our device. It will run the model in device and then it will return the output back to the application. Now let's talk about NNAPI. Main functionality of NNAPI is to abstract the AI hardware to app developers and ML frameworks. To explain this in more detail, let's take an example. You have an Android app with the ML model for face detection. Now it, it's running fine in a Qualcomm SOC, either using hexagon DSP or GPU or CPU in that particular uh, board. The same app should work just fine in a MediaTek SOC. 
by taking advantage of the APU present in it. This needs to happen without any change in your code or any additional library added to your code. So earlier this was not possible, but now this is achieved through a common API called NN API. App developers don't need to worry about AI hardware available in the code. Just like how app developers don't worry about who the camera and modem manufacturers are in a typical mobile device, they don't need to worry about the AI hardware also. Another point to add here is we have multiple processor or hardware capable of running AI models now in a single SOC. You can run it in GPU, DSP or CPU all present in the same SOC. Someone needs to schedule and make better use of all the available resources that can run AI. That is being done by NN API. From hardware manufacturer's perspective, to support Android, they don't need to worry about whether we user will use TF or PyTorch. They can simply adhere to NN API. NN API is a C-based API. It has its own model representation and a list of supported apps. It supports commonly used apps and it is a subset of what TF and TF Lite runtime supports. As we mentioned earlier, ML frameworks that we are using in our app should support NN API. If you look at the picture in the right side, at the one end we have ML frameworks, at the other end we have uh, NN Hall driver and the hardware that we are going to run. So basically both these should support NN API so that app developer can seamlessly run their ML models. Two widely used frameworks namely TF and PyTorch supports NN API. Though PyTorch support is not fully matured, it only has experimental support right now. Till now, we have looked at Android OS, AI on Android, and then NN API. Now let's take a look at NN Hall driver, which is a core component in NN API. This driver acts as a bridge between the hardware vendors, inference engine, and NN API. Let's take a look at it. It's the responsibility of each hardware vendor to implement NN Hall driver. If your SOC has three AI capable processors in your device, then each hardware will have its own version of this driver registered with NN API. Main function of this driver is to convert model from NN API's format to hardware vendor's inference engine format. And then use this converted model to run inference on all input data. If none of the device supports a model, then NAP will execute it in CPU. Now let's take a quick look at the interaction between NN API and uh, this driver. We have a picture at the right side which uh, depicts this flow. At the left side we have uh, Android framework and the right side we have Android driver. You can consider this Android framework as NN API and then this vendor driver is obviously our NN Hall driver. First, NN API will query each registered device about its capabilities. This will include things like uh, power usage, etc. We will uh, see about this in detail in the upcoming slides. Once it gets these capabilities, it will again query uh, each driver about the operators uh, those devices support. Based on these two info, NN API will uh, you know, divide the model across all the available devices and uh, it will uh, schedule those models in all the eligible devices then it will be executed and uh, output will be written. So this is a very high level for flow of how a driver will communicate with Android to facilitate this inference execution. In this section, we will discuss about solution provided by multi-coreware to one of our customers and how we enabled Android support for their hardware. Let's take a look at it. Now let's take a look at the pipeline. At the top we have application 
followed by ML framework. From ML framework, the model will be converted to NNAP format and it will be dispatched to NNAP runtime. Within NNAP runtime, we have three main stages. First one is init, second one is compilation, and the third is execution. In the init stage, it has a functionality called get capabilities where it will query each available device for two data points, execution time and power usage. The way we get these two data points is Android has a benchmark app that we need to run on our device and uh, get these two data points. The app has a predefined workload that will run on our device and for that workload, we will get this execution time and power usage. Once it gets this info from all the available devices, it will proceed to compilation stage. In this compilation stage, first it will query all the supported ops. Each device might have its own uh, support matrix, right? So it will query all the device about its operator support. Once it gets this info, it will use these two uh, main data points, get capabilities and uh, supported operator list. These two info will be used to partition the available model between all the devices. For example, we might have three available devices. So this model will be partitioned across the, these three devices in such a way that uh, we are making good use of all the available hardware resources. Uh, if you have an AI accelerator in your SOC, then your most compute intensive layer might get dispatched to that particular uh, accelerator. So once we get a subgraph within our driver, we will check if that model is already cached, meaning if you already used that for inference, chances are it might be cached. NNAP has a caching mechanism where a converted model is stored in its cache. If not, we will run a function called prepare model from where we will convert a model from NNAP's buffer to customer's inference engine format. Once this conversion is done, we will check if it is successful or not. If it is successful, we will cache this and proceed for execution. If not, we will uh, execute that whole uh, subgraph in uh, CPU. Yeah. In the execution stage, we will have uh, that uh, successfully converted model iteratively executing on uh, input provided by the ML framework. So this is the overall flow. Here you can see this uh, driver acting as a bridge between the Android and the device. Here device can also be simulator, uh, only this driver can communicate with the device and I will only communicate with this driver part. So this pretty much sums up the flow of the pipeline that we implemented. And another thing to take care is regarding quantization. Typically if you have a TF8 model, it has its own uh, quantization scheme. Chances are, uh, your hardware might have its own custom quantization logic. In that case, we need to convert whatever quantization that is being used in this model provided by the application to this inference engine specific uh, quantization. So those things needs to be taken care to make full use of the hardware. Yeah, I hope this gives a picture of how an NNAP driver communicates with Android and uh, how to implement a new driver for your hardware. Okay, we have reached the final section in our uh, case study. Let's take a look at the research development with respect to NNAP. One such uh, important thing is NNAP is uh, moving out of core Android OS. We can update it through Play Store. Uh, this is uh, not yet released, it is still work in progress. Uh, since it is part of core OS, it's difficult for hardware vendors to push updates regularly. So Android is working to make it modular so that it's easier for uh, us to push updates regularly. Coming to this final and important slide on why multi-coreware, I just want to stress on these three points. First one is, we have proven expertise in enabling Android NN support for one of our customers hardware. Second, full stack AI development. We have deep understanding of all layers in modern AI stack. This unique skill combination is our strength. It helps us to connect the dots and fast track your 
AI product development. Third, we have 10 plus years of proven expertise in heterogeneous computing and uh, microarchitecture of our programming. This is even before AI became a thing and uh, AI needed heterogeneous computing. So these are the things that I wanted to cover. Hope this uh, session was uh, informative to you. Please feel free to ask any questions if you have in the chat box. We'll be happy to reply. Thanks for uh, patiently listening for the past 20 minutes. Have a great day. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar session on optimizing neural network operations for um, AIR deep learning accelerators. Um, this is Nadia working as engineering manager at MultiCoreWay and I'm the presenter of today's second case study from Center of Excellence Group. The focus of this talk is to walk you through why hand optimizing neural network operations are important and how with MultiCoreWay's expertise we go about optimizing neural network based operations for any AI accelerated hardware. If you are a deep learning or AI acceleration based company, looking for technical partners to create you know, handcrafted um, you know, library consisting of several neural network operations like convolution, max pool, uh, batch norm, et cetera, to get the best performance out of your hardware. Or if you want to optimize and support end-to-end -end neural network models like uh, mobile net, efficient net, YOLO for your architecture, then this webinar is for you. This slide is the agenda for today's session. Uh, first, I will talk about multi-coreware's uh, typical customer profile, followed by optimizing performance and step-by-step uh, -step procedure of how multi goes about optimizing performance for the target architecture. Starting from understanding the given hardware architecture and ISA, uh, performance estimation, functional implementation, so on and so forth. I have taken uh, Cadence Vision P6 as an example for some of my illustration today. Uh, P6 is a DSP for embedded vision and AI from Cadence. Okay. Who are our typical customers? Our customers are a DSP for AI or deep learning accelerator based companies with uh, custom architecture looking to accelerate machine learning inference and training computations. And these customers would like to create a highly optimized hand tuned neural network library to get the maximum performance out of their hardware. Okay, um, so about optimizing performance. So let's look at the diagram on the slide that shows the neural network uh, execution ecosystem, starting from machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, CAFE, and PyTorch. So at top level, when we train our deep learning models using these frameworks, the models are uh, you know compiled using compilers like MLIR and GLOW. And the nodes in the neural network graphs are mapped with hand-tuned kernels before the binary uh, for the targets get generated. Right? So just to step back a little bit. So we know that to get the best performance while running the neural network inference or training out of the hardware, it's crucial to create algorithm defines, uh, designs that can reduce latency, improve throughput, and reduce memory footprint, etc. And we all know that when machine learning engineer designs a model, most of the time he's not concerned about models throughput on the target device, right? So where does optimization happen? So firstly, the compiler plays a role in optimizing the performance of neural network inference or training. So for machine learning uh, models, we have compilers that convert the deep neural network graph into something called as intermediate representation, popularly known as IR. And there are different levels of IR that the compiler can create and, and then it goes and performs optimization at each IR level. The higher level IR, demo, IR demonstrates the model's control flow at a very top level and represents the dependency between operator and data. And this representation is generally hardware independent. Okay, With higher level IR, the compiler performs different optimization including node level and block level optimizations. Node level optimization is nothing but uh, the compiler concentrates on each node in the graph and removes unnecessary operations to get more efficient graph. And in block level, um, multiple nodes uh, as a block can be optimized and replaced with just one node. 
um, and several operator based optimizations like operator fusion and operation uh, syncing are all performed by the compiler to create efficient graph and in the low level ir it is very close to machine architecture and optimizes the code at hardware level based on hardware properties and also the compiler in the back end is responsible for all hardware specific optimization and finally generating the executable although compiler can perform optimization at different ir levels uh, the code generated by the compiler may not be more efficient compared to the highly tuned implementation right so as you can see on the right side diagram although there are compilers in the ecosystem most vendors uh, like nvidia intel so they try to create their optimized neural network uh, in numerical library uh, in order to get the maximum utilization um, of the hardware resources and there are several reasons on why hand tuning is better so one of the advantages is the data locality right so when we hand optimize um, uh, in algorithms like convolution max pool etc the data can be rearranged and uh, loaded into the local memory and the data can be kept in uh, continuous memory in the order that we process it so that uh, you know the performance is better and we also have a choice of selecting suitable ia isa instruction to perform you know complex mathematical operations uh, when we hand tune um, so this is why you know having a hand tuned uh, uh, neural network or numerical library is very important Now for the rest of the session, I'll take you all through different steps that we follow um, to handcraft the algorithms for the target architecture. Yeah, the very first step in op optimizing any given algorithm for the target architecture is to understand the architecture very well. Uh, just to explain what I mean by that, I've taken uh, Cadence Vision P6 architecture uh, for the illustration purpose. Uh, there are several components in the P6 architecture that will be useful for the engineers to understand before even uh, they start optimizing algorithms, uh, such as you know uh, vector processing units that's uh, shown in the middle of the diagram. Uh, you know, understanding uh, whether there are instruction and data caches. Uh, for example, uh, P6 does not have a data cache instead it has uh, two local data memories uh, that are shown on the uh, top of this uh, diagram along with idma engine uh, p6 also has uh, you know optional uh, vector uh, floating point uh, unit v uh, fpu so that uh, we can also run floating point based computations on the device if required and some information on the register file is also important to uh, understand p6 has uh, you know 32 vector register files uh, along with four accumulator resistors and predicate resistors. Um, there is also load and store and you know gather engines in the architecture, etc. Uh, so the summary is that uh, it's necessary to have some level of understanding of the architecture before uh, you know the developers uh, start their hands on. Uh, this is just a, a continuation of the earlier slide. Uh, this one summarizes the key features of P6, uh, which is good to um, you know uh, understand before we uh, begin the optimization. Uh, so P6 has um, you know 1024 uh, 512 bits load and store capabilities. Uh, it can also perform uh, 256 uh, multiply and accumulation uh, on 8-bit data. Uh, the processor supports 8-bit, uh, 16-bit, and 32-bit uh, fixed-point processing. Uh, and as I said, it also supports uh, floating-point 32 and uh, floating-point 16 uh, processing. Uh, P6 has integrated uh, IDMA, and, uh, uh, and it also provides support for user-defined instructions. Uh, the next step uh, would be to understand the instruction set architecture, uh, which is ISA. Um, again, I'll be taking P6 as an example for some of the uh, illustration here as well. Um, uh, so uh, as part of the ISA, uh, first thing is we need to understand the support for data parallelism, which I believe most of the AI processors support now. Uh, it's important to understand the SIMD width or vector length that the processor support. For example, P6 supports uh, uh, 64 by 8 bit wide vector and uh, uh, we need to also understand what different data format uh, that is supported in the ISA. Uh, 
for example, int 8, int 16, FP16, etc. And uh, with respect to registers, uh, yes, it's important to understand uh, the uh, you know number of vector registers available and other special register types. Um, and another important uh, point to uh, note is that we need we must understand various uh, you know arithmetic and logical operations that are supported in ISA operations including data load, store, uh, multiply, accumulate, uh, move and select operations, etc. So apart from data parallelism, some processors are, are also VLIW based. Um, so VLIW stands for very long instruction word architectures. Uh, it is an appropriate alternative for exploiting uh, instruction level parallelism in programs, especially for uh, you know performing more than one uh, basic uh, instructions at a time. These processes include uh, you know various functional units. Uh, they fetch from instruction cache a very long instruction word, including various primitive instruction, and dispatch the whole VLIW for parallel implementation. Uh, if the processor is a VLIW based, uh, adding to uh, all the other items uh, I said earlier, it is also useful to understand about different VLIW uh, slots, what operations are supported in each of the slots and what are not supported, um, etc. Uh, once we understand the architecture and ISA, we are good to go with uh, optimizing the algorithms. Uh, but just before that, uh, we need to have a functional implementation of the target ops or algorithm to be optimized in any language uh, like MATLAB, Python, or C++, and it has to be um, confirmed by the customer before we start optimizing uh, for the target architecture. Uh, in most cases, we take uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow implementation of the ops as a reference for our optimization work. Uh, and this mainly serves as a golden reference for hand optimization work. And the aim of hand optimization would be to bit match uh, the result with the reference implementation. As part of the work, we also work on uh, creating a test suit, uh, which can perform unit tests and other end-to-end -end model tests to verify the correctness of the optimized implementation against uh, reference implementation. Um, once we have the functional implementation before um, hand optimizing the algorithm for the target, the important step is to come up with the design of the algorithm and estimate the performance of the algorithm for the target. The goal is to come up with a best case performance number uh, for the given algorithm and this will be considered as the target performance uh, for the hand optimization. The estimation is a pretty straightforward process. You need to consider some factors for estimating the performance. Uh, the first step is to understand the algorithm better and identify how many and what different SIMD instructions are required for the innermost loop of the algorithm. Uh, you need to have a better understanding of VLIW slots if your processor supports it. Uh, for example, how many slots are there in a VLIW instruction and what vector instructions can be packed together and what cannot be packed together because of hardware limitations, etc. Additionally, you should also understand the throughput of vector operations uh, that are required for the computation of the target algorithm. For example, the throughput of multiply and accumulate instruction is uh, for P6 is 256 max per cycle as we saw in our earlier slides. With all this information, we can come up with a theoretical performance estimate for the algorithm. Um, so I've shown a, a very simple example in the slide. Um, so the first two points here are the assumptions and the uh, last two points are the performance estimate. Um, so the assumption is that the processor has total of five VLIW slots, which means we can pack uh, five vector um, instructions in one single uh, VLIW. Uh, and out of uh, five uh, slots, um, the processor, the assumption is that uh, the processor supports three ALU um, vector operations in uh, one VLIW um, and also the assumption is that uh, the algorithm that we have uh, requires uh, six ALU vector operations to be performed um, uh, inside the inner loop and it performs the operations on um, 64 8-bit uh, data. So um, so given these two assumptions, uh, the estimate uh, should be done uh, in such a way that uh, we have to assume um, out of six ALU operations, three can be performed in one VLIW uh, instruction 
and uh, the rest of the three ALU uh, must be done uh, in the second VLIW uh, instruction, which means the whole uh, six ALU vector operations can be uh, completed in two cycles. And hence, um, the expected throughput is 190 to 8 bit uh, elements because uh, you know one single VLIW supports uh, three ALU. So when we uh, get the throughput of three vector uh, uh, operations on 64 by 8 bit data, the throughput is 192 8 bit uh, elements per cycle. Um, and uh, we need to uh, make assumptions, uh, certain assumptions when we are estimating the performance. So some of the assumptions include, you know, scheduling of the operations and how the compiler will rearrange the instructions written in uh, intrinsic and importantly uh, we have not considered the data load and store cycles for the estimation which means that um, the hand optimized code is expected to have minimal load and um, store latency impact in the overall performance of the optimized code Um, the next and important step is to optimize the target uh, algorithm for the architecture. You know, there are a number of best practices that we follow when we design and implement uh, the algorithm. I have listed some here. Um, so starting with uh, reducing the memory access, um, the memory related operations such as data read and write are the most expensive in terms of cycles. Uh, even with today's advanced processors, each external memory data load and store can effectively take multiple cycles. Um, so to speed up any algorithm, it is essential to uh, keep a tab on the memory accesses. Um, so in order to reduce the data read and write, uh, we can try several approaches, including fetch data once, use maximum, and use hash defines for constants uh, wherever possible, etc. So the next um, step is, uh, you know, ensuring that we handle the data properly. Uh, which includes uh, you know declaring the input output buffers in aligned address space um, to avoid loading data from an aligned address which is costly and as a real-time programmer you want to reduce the access to off chip which is external memory because the time to access the external memory can be long and causing a huge processing delays um, the pipeline must stall or wait for the processor to load this memory. So use of on-chip memory, therefore, is one of the most effective ways to increase the performance. And the next is to reduce the math operations in your um, um, program, right? So math operations such as multiplication and divisions must be used minimally. Though the compilers are intelligent enough to, you know, replace, multiply and divide with shift wherever possible, it's better that the programmer specifies uh, shifts in the code to help the compiler produce the better optimized code and the next thing is to controlling um, you know live variables every processor has limited user registers um, the compiler make its best attempt to accommodating all the variables in the execution context to those registers but if there are more variables in the code than there are registers available the compiler has no other options than to locate the variable onto the stack uh, in such situations, um, additional burdens are placed on the processor engine. To avoid this, uh, the best practice is to restrict the use of live variables so that they fit on the internal registers. Uh, this can be achieved through good programming techniques, um, such as reusing the temporary variables, splitting a complex model with many, uh, many variables, uh, analyzing the disassembly and identifying the register spells, etc. Uh, next is to use uh, you know pre-calculated values wherever possible so there are a number of situations where it will be possible to remove a piece of code or formula in the uh, in the program uh, and replace it with a pre-calculated value while this requires additional memory from the system it significantly reduces the calculation overhead at runtime and therefore speeds up the algorithm and uh, finally uh, loop handling uh, right so optimizations related to loop handling results in positive effects most of the time but uh, they must be practiced as a last optimization step uh, stage uh, due to some methods like uh, loop unrolling and splitting which dramatically increases the code size and make the code unreadable uh, the most effective uh, loop related optimizations uh, include you know loop merging splitting unrolling etc i can be tried to optimize the loop computation um, so these are 
some of the best practices that we follow to create optimize the implementation of any um, target algorithm um, along with that um, carefully selecting the right vector instructions from isa for our required computation is also a necessary step um, that contributes to better performance uh, once the code is optimized um, cycles can be measured on you know so the customers uh, simulation environment to calculate the actual performance on the uh, of the implementation uh, so this performance is compared against the performance estimation that we did in our earlier step and if there are any gaps between the actual performance and the estimated performance the disassembly of the module can be further analyzed uh, to identify how the instructions are scheduled where the stall occurred in the pipeline etc and the algorithm implementation needs to be updated accordingly until the performance is close to the estimate and uh, once the implementation passes all the tests in the test suite uh, they can be ported onto the actual device and can be verified for its uh, functionality and performance uh, direct memory access or dma is another option um, for speeding up the dsp uh, execution rate uh, the right side diagram shows the uh, cadence vision um, DSP architecture where we uh, where we have shown uh, different components in the DSP processor. As you can see, there is a DSP core and there is IDMA engine, which is integrated DMA. We also have a local RAM um, that is close to the processor and it is faster to access. And there is DDR memory that is off the chip and accessing data from off chip uh, memory is costly. The DMA engine uh, is used to write data directly uh, to and from memory, taking the burden off the processor. And here especially uh, the DMA is very useful to move the data uh, between local RAM and DDA, DDR memory. Uh, so the other advantage of having DMA is that the processor can issue instruction to DMA to move data and then it can go back to what it was doing. Uh, this is just another way of exploiting parallelism built into the device. Having said that, uh, the DSP processes generally uh, deal with higher rate of data processing, especially for computer vision and deep learning processing. And we know that operations on off chip uh, or DDR memory is costly. So the best way to process the input is to bring it onto the on chip memory and perform the computation. And for this, uh, DMA uh, can be very useful. If the data being processed uh, cannot uh, fit um, onto the on chip memory fully, um, you know, as the it is the case with the larger arrays then the data can be staged on and off the chips in blocks in blocks or tiles uh, using dma uh, all of the data transfers uh, generally will happen in the background while the processor is actually crunching the data so smart management and layout of on chip memory can reduce the amount of time the data has to be staged on and off the chip it is worth the time and effort to develop a smart plan on uh, how to use the on-chip memory effectively. Um, Multi-coreware can help you in all three uh, different areas. Um, uh, one is, um, of course, optimization of various uh, neural network operations for the target uh, microarchitecture. And the second area is when you have some ops written for a specific architecture and and you want to uh, port it to the next gen uh, architecture uh, that's uh, definitely one area we can help and also if uh, you're looking to support and optimize end-to-end -end neural network models uh, including data transfers um, we can help you there um, and also multi-coreware uh, has experience and expertise uh, you know working on uh, different target platforms including DSPs, AI process, GPUs, and VPUs. So if you're one of them um, looking for any of these um, work, um, please feel free to uh, reach out to Multicoreware for support. Uh, why uh, Multicoreware for uh, optimizing um, operations or algorithms? Uh, because we have um, you know decade of experience in heterogeneous programming and architecture aware algorithm optimization 
and uh, we have experience um, working in different novel architectures and we have done optimization using intrinsics and assembly uh, we also have experience working in profiling performance analysis and optimization of various workloads um, so we also have a very good uh, expertise in uh, computer vision and deep learning technologies uh, we're also capable of um, forming a performance engineering team for customers in a short time um, we also have the ability to independently work on neural network library creation or uh, end-to-end -end model support uh, without much cycles from the customer Um, so with that, uh, I conclude uh, my presentation um, and I'm happy to take up uh, any questions from the audience now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nadia and Bhupati. I, I learned a lot, although I, you know, I'm aware of all the work that happens as marketing. I, I get to learn something new every time I hear you folks talk. So thank you so much for it. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Maybe I'll post it to them. Maybe first to Bhupadi. Is it possible to run a model completely in a single device of a choice using an, an API? What are your views on that, Bhupadi? Yeah, so we can definitely do that. An, an API has a flag to override its control on uh, partitioning the model. If we do that, then we can uh, delegate a whole uh, graph to uh, our device for execution. This is possible, just that it's not the cleanest way, but if that is a requirement, we can definitely do it. Thank you. Um, and you know, generally we we talk about quantization scheme, right? I mean, uh, from your experience, ha have you worked on converting a quantization scheme, so to speak? Yeah, we have worked on many uh, widely used quantization scheme be it uh, TensorFlow supported quantization or PyTAR supported quantization. And there are also other uh, uh, publications from which we have some uh, widely popular quantization schemes. We have uh, worked on uh, many of those and we have also worked on converting uh, one quantization logic to let's say uh, your hardware supported quantization. Awesome, thanks Bhupadi. Yeah. I think a couple of questions for Nadia. Nadia, uh, the question here is, uh, you know, to port a specific op uh, for a target processor, how much time does it usually take, uh, ballpark based on your, you know, experience? Yeah, so uh, uh, as I said, uh, we have experience uh, in porting um, deep learning based ops for um, several of the A processor and accelerators in the past. Uh, but um, I mean, I cannot, uh, you know, mention any specific number right now without understanding about the, you know, architecture details and, um, you know, looking at some of the examples. So if I have these details, I'll be in a better position to, you know, do the uh, effort estimation uh, for coding the ops for the target processor. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and uh, how about uh, mm -hmm. coding? training-based ops for any of these AI accelerators from your, you know, pro the different uh, projects and the customers that you have dealt with? Yeah, we have certainly worked uh, with, uh, you know, many of our customers in porting uh, both training as well as inference kernels. So uh, we have, uh, in fact, worked with, uh, you know, backward implementations of, uh, you know, some of the kernels like Convolution Max Pool and software, SoftMax for uh, multiple uh, our customers. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Let me check if any other question came in. That's looks like it uh, so thank you folks uh, who were able to join i know there were some folks who couldn't join because at least from india it was a little bit late and us uh, you know it uh, you know it's 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 sort of a bit early nevertheless uh, if you have registered you should receive a recorded video of this webinar so please do review that again if you need to and if you have any questions you can reach out to the multi-core variety and if you have any other suggestions or any other topics that you would like multi-core where to kind of 
you know address in the subsequent webinars then please do let us know uh, once again thank you from wherever you are thank you so much for your time and thanks to speakers Bhupati and Nadia for a class act in presenting these case studies and the larger team that was involved in you know making this webinar possible thank you so much have a great day